Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here tonight. Uh, thank you for joining us both here at the museum and for those of you that are watching live on YouTube. Thank you. My name is Marie Vickles. I'm the Director of Education here at the museum, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's Shoal Lecture Series presented by Goldman Sachs, featuring the incredible photographer Marilyn Nance. A few acknowledgments before we get started and a little bit about tonight's program. For tonight's program, we will learn more about Marilyn's work as a world-renowned photographer that has produced photographs documenting unique moments in the cultural history of the United States and the African diaspora. A very special thank you goes out to Deborah and Dennis Scholl for their ongoing support of this important lecture series, and Greg Ferrero of Goldman Sachs for their additional support of this important and inspiring program. Thank you. Yes. And I would also be remiss if I did not thank the incredible team of people that are working so very hard to produce our PAM education programs. I would like to acknowledge Anita Bram, Associate Director of Adult and Public Programs, Janessa Melendez, Education Coordinator, and our world-class audiovisual team, Denise Faxis, Andrew Bird, and Lazaro Yanis on video and cameras. Thank you, we couldn't do this without you. Okay, let's get started with tonight's program with an introduction of our featured speaker. Over the course of five decades, Marilyn Nance has produced photographs of unique moments in the cultural history of the U.S. and the African diaspora, culminating in an archive of images of late 20th century African American life. A two-time finalist for the W. Eugene Smith Award in Humanistic Photography, Marilyn is a recipient of the 2022 Magnum Foundation Counter Histories Grant and a 2023 New York State Council of the Arts Individual Artists Grant. Her work is in the collections of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and the Library of Congress. Her work has been published in the World History of Photography, History of Women in Photography, and the Black Photographer's Annual. While serving as the photographer for the U.S. delegation of Festac 77, also known as the second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, Marilyn made one of the most comprehensive photographic accounts of this epic gathering of international black cultural expression. In 2022, she published Marilyn Nance, Last Day in Lagos, edited by Oluremi C. Onobanjo. I hope I said that right, Marilyn. All right. <laughs> the publication, Last Day in Lagos, presents a focused study of Marilyn's photography organized into a visual and narrative archival encounter as she documented Festac 77. An opening quote in this book says it best. If you want to hold something real in your hands, you need to hold this. And that is actually very attainable as we have copies for purchase at the top of the stairs and in our museum shop. I had to plug it. I have my copy and I recommend you get yours. It's an incredible book. So at the end of tonight's program, we will have a short moment for questions. And if you are joining us on YouTube, post your questions in the comments section and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. All right, without further ado, join me in giving a warm welcome to Marilyn Nance. Give me a moment. Oh, am I switched on? You can hear me. Great, 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 great. I'm so glad that you came out tonight. I am thankful for all of those people who made this visit of mine to Miami possible. And I just want to let everyone know that Miami in late June and July is really wonderful. So <laughs> invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Marilyn Nance. And for all of those people that made this visit possible, I'm very thankful. Uh, I realized that uh, maybe you never heard of Marilyn Nance before, and a lot of people have been wondering, how did I come to do this book? 
And I had to think about that also. How did, how did I come to do this book? So what I'm going to present tonight is a visual timeline of my life. It won't, it won't be long, though. Um, I'll do some skips and jumps, but I, I really had to, re the, in the process of making Last Day in Lagos, I had to reflect on a lot of things. I mean, the photographs were made in 1977, close to the beginning of the time in which I started photographing with 35 millimeter film. So I started photographing with 35 millimeter film in 1972. But in actuality, I've been photographing since I was a little girl. So I started this presentation with me as a, as a little girl. Because if we're lucky enough, a little black girl will grow up to be an old black lady. So, so I, I will begin. This is a photograph of me in the um, first grade. And I was born in 1953, so I'm estimating that this photograph was made in 1954. That's me in the baby carriage with my mom and my older sister in Brooklyn, New York. And if anyone, a lot of people here of transplants, so if anyone knows where the Navy Yard is, that's what's be, okay, there's a hand up in the back. That's a Navy Yard in back of us, uh, and which is now a Wegmans. Uh, you know, so Brooklyn has changed, and, and so have I. But in some ways, in thinking about, uh, in thinking about the photographs and thinking about myself, I think we're always the person that we always were. I remember being a child thinking that whatever I thought, I better not say. So I couldn't wait until I grew up. So I'm glad to be the age that I am now. Um, I grew up with a lot of family photographs uh, in, I guess it was a photo album, and this is one of the photographs that, um, that I grew up with. It's a photograph on the left is my mother and me sitting there looking really spooky. And, this, and on the right are two of my cousins, an older cousin and a cousin who's uh, close to my age. And we were sitting at the tomb or the gravesite of Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee, Institute where my cousin, another cousin, was a nursing student. And I thought, like, how many people have children's pictures of them sitting at a grave? And I thought, hmm, that's, that's interesting. Um, and there was one point when I was in graduate school that I thought about this. I said, wasn't I sitting at a grave site? Where, where is that image? And I was able to pull it up because um, when I grew up, we had the photographs and we also had the negatives. And I grew up with um, you know, manipulating photographs. And one of the things that I did was, like, as a child, I don't know what age I, I, I cut this photograph out and rounded the edges. And now it looks like a TV. So was I sort of thinking about media? Maybe I was. Uh, even if, if I go back, the first image, is there's a, a dot screen there. Was I thinking about printing? Maybe I was. Um, so this is me in the first grade, which I guess was about 1958. And this picture, when, whenever you see a little black girl, whenever you see a little child, they're thinking, because I remember some of the thoughts that I had. Um, and I remember not exactly watching television, but being affected by things in the news. And um, we read magazines. I was an early reader. We read magazines. I don't remember television that much, but um, certainly this is one of the events that, uh, that affected me. And I realized that in reflection much later. Th this is um, a, a luncheonette sit-in, and the person who's second from the right is Diane Nash, and it's in Nashville, Tennessee in 1960. Now, when I think about this, I mean, I remember being a child, and we grew up in Brooklyn, New York, which is um, in Brooklyn, in the, in the Farragut Housing Projects, which was very close to the neighborhood of Brooklyn Heights. So we talk about, you know, low income, high income. And as children, we would wander into the, you know, we, we would take to the streets and we would go into other neighborhoods. And one of the things that we did as children was to sit, like go to a luncheonette in the white neighborhood, sit at the counter and order water. 
you know? <laughs> and, and it wasn't until I was older, passing by that same luncheonette, that I realized, oh my goodness, we were playing back the civil rights movement in our own lives, our, our own young lives. So that was, this event happened in 1960. This is about 1961, I was in the third grade, and I don't know how many people can tell which one is me. Anybody? The one with the book? No, oh, in the middle? No. Striped dress, the striped dress. I'm the one with the striped dress, and yeah. Yeah, I had a little something on my waist. I think it was probably all my money. Uh, this, was a, this was a third grade uh, trip uh, to Central Park, and these were my classmates, some of whom I'm still in contact with, which is a real blessing. Well, thank you, Facebook. Um, <laughs> and um, since it's 1961, and in 1963 was, uh, the March on Washington is a March on Washington for what was it for jobs and freedom? But I remember it being called the March on Washington, and a local church was going to the March on Washington, and my mother would not. I wanted to go. I remember like I don't know if I begged my mother, asked my mother, but I know that my mother would not let me go, and so I was thinking somebody must have gone. So I Googled little girl march on Washington. And I got this photograph uh, on the internet of uh, Edith Payne. It's a photograph by Roland Sh uh, Sherman. So some, some little girl went to the March on Washington, which was in 1963. And I guess at the age of, I wasn't even 10 then. So here was a nine-year-old girl who wanted to go to the March on Washington, but couldn't, couldn't go. Now, I have to say that my mother was from Birmingham, Alabama, and here we were living in Brooklyn. So 1963 in August was the March on Washington. 1963 in September was the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And it only dawned on me like in much later years, oh, that's why my mother didn't want me to go to the March on Washington. Having been from Birmingham, Alabama, she knew the kind of things that could happen. And um, 1963, in 1963, there were, um, there were actually more than four people who were killed. Um, but these are, these are known as the four little girls. It was Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, Addie Mae Collins, and Carol Robertson. And they were my age. And, and so in 1963, just little girls going to Sunday school were, um, were, were murdered, were, were bombed. And others, many others were injured. Um, later on, uh, I did, I mean, I went to Birmingham, Alabama, like lots and lots and lots of times as a young person, but also when I was in college, uh, I would go back in the summertime and stay with my grandmother and just walk around and make photographs. And as an adult, I went to Birmingham, Alabama, and I have many Birmingham stories. I won't go into them now because we're trying to get to last day in Lagos. Uh, 1968 was um, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And I was in junior high school then. Um, and when I think about that event, well, I, the first thing I think about is how there were riots, like in, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, people were just really destroyed and tore the place up. But when I think of this um, event in images, in my mind, I, and I don't know where I first saw this image, the image of these men pointing to the direction in which the shots were fired. Um, 1968, I was in junior high school and I went to high school. And there I joined the Black Students Union. So that, in 68 was a very political time, especially in New York City. In New York City, um, there was a big teacher strike in 1968. And I went to school every day because we had like a free school and we, we were really political. And um, so I was part of the, the citywide New York City Black Students Union. And in 1972, I went to college. And there I was at 
the first school that I went to was New York University. And this was before the advent of cable TV. And there were, um, we had a big um, conference called Beware the Cable, which was talking about how cable could be used for surveillance. And everything was political then. And um, nobody was in therapy because if, you know, we had an issue, we, we had other outlets, you know. And now I think when people have issues or when the system feels like oppressive, people feel like it's them. But back then we were expressing things outwardly, like, won't go into detail. 1972, um, I was a student at New York University, and um, there, was the Institute of African American Affairs, which still exists. And one of the magazines that uh, came out of the Institute was called Black Creation. And not only was there poetry, essays, but the works of a lot of black photographers. And they even had an ad in there for the Black Photographers Annual. And um, I, that's how I got familiar with people like you know, Buford Smith, who I'm in contact with to, to this day. Um, so in 1972, I, I, I understood something about photography. I was influenced by the ways in which a photograph could make a person think. But I hadn't declared myself a photographer at that point. But uh, in, between, in the summer of 1972, I, I actually switched to Pratt Institute. So in between NYU and Pratt Institute, I was not uh, I didn't have a summer job, and there was a photo workshop in my community. And I joined the, uh, the photo workshop. Lots of people who were there at the beginning left, and I pretty much had a dark room to myself for the entire summer. And this is one of the first photographs I made. I no longer have the negatives. Don't leave your negatives at a boyfriend's house, is all I want to say. You know, <laughs> but I do, this is part of, this is a, a test print that, that I had. And one of the things that, um, that, that I think about now, number one, I held on to a test print. Who does that? But I held on, to, I'm glad that I did. And one of the, this was probably from the first roll of, of 35 millimeter film that I ever exposed. And I pointed out the window and there were children playing like a circle game. Kids don't even do that anymore. So the things that we just make images of are become history. Uh, in 1972, I switched to Pratt Institute and met other creatively minded people. And this is an, an, a photograph of me made by Lolita Standard. So it, it's one that I appreciate because it kind of points to like my spiritual nature. Yeah, but I, I just like that. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad that I have it. So like for the images that your friends make and your families, family members make, it really becomes precious. And, and when, as, when I was a student at Pratt Institute, I, well, I was a student in graphic design and not photography, but I did take a photo class, Photo 101, because I wasn't quite sure I'd learned everything you know, maybe there was something I didn't learn in the summer photo workshop. So I took Photo 101, and um, I was so bored with the uh, assignments and had the nerve to tell the instructor, who I'm still in contact with now, oh, God, I can, can, I'm just like, this is boring. And he said, well, since this class is mainly about how to make a good print, you know, and I, I think maybe he had seen me making prints from old family negatives. He said, if you just like continue to do that, that will be fine. So I had family um, negatives. And this is uh, an image of my mom, my dad, and brother in maybe in the 40s sometime. And um, I, made, I made this print. And um, I do know that people that keep prints and throw out the negatives, that's like, no, don't, don't do that. So I've always been one to hold on to things. And I think that that's really, a, that, that, there's a lot to be said about black women's archives. But my mom was not a, she held on to significant things. And I'm glad that I sort of picked up that gene from her. Um, again, as a student at Pratt Institute, well, I 
I took a course called Documentary Photography. Actually audited it because at that point I was a student in University Without Walls, which was a subset of Pratt Institute. And I worked in the photo um, public relations photo lab of Pratt Institute, which for me was my photo education, doing invoices and photographing, uh, I don't know, check presentations and buildings going up and meetings and graduations. And one day I got a call and said, oh, we're, we're all taking a group photo. So I ran over to campus and put myself in the front, <laughs> in the middle. But you know, it, this was a, a good group of people. You cannot tell in this image who was the supervisor. You'd think it was me, because I'm acting like that. But um, it was um, like we would go out and eat. And like tonight, we had some Middle Eastern food. And that's how I got to know hummus and baba ganoush and grilled eggplant and you know things like that. Because I think when you're building community, food becomes part of that. Uh, and some of these people I'm in contact with to today. So I think one strain that you might hear is that how you stay in contact with people. And to a large extent, technology has enabled me to keep those bonds together. Back in the day, um, I was a mailer. I sent postcards out. I sent photographs out. I, you know, but I don't do that like I, I used to. And, in, in some ways, like I can make a photograph. I mean, I made a photograph a minute ago, well, a, a little while ago, and it's already on Instagram, I mean, because I want people to, to know. Uh, so I like technology and uses of it, but that's new stuff, and I've always appreciated the old stuff. This is a photograph that I made in 1975, and when I printed it, um, at Pratt Institute, when I made prints in, in, in the school darkroom, everyone said, well, who made that image? Like, you know, this looks so old, you know? I said, I made it, you made this? And so I had a knack for, you know, making things look old, I guess, or, or recognizing, having, being a kindred spirit to older people or older, older things. And this was an image, um, I said that I was, uh, uh, photographing for the Public Relations uh, Office of Pratt Institute, and there was a whole group of student, um, student photographers. And at some point, the supervisor left, and they discontinued the office. And I thought, hmm, I know how to do this. And I started photographing, or taking my port uh, a portfolio around, and the, the, I think the first freelance job that I had, and I don't even like the word freelancer, let me just say, a free lance comes from the days of like old where you know you had a lance and you'd just fight for anybody. I won't fight for just anybody. But um, so as an independent photographer, my first uh, uh, position was working uh, with the Village Voice. And uh, a couple of the people were Pratt graduates. And the first assignment I got was broadly, I didn't read the article, broadly photograph a black girl growing up in Harlem. And the assignment was due on Monday, and the paper came out on Wednesday. And on Sunday, I thought, ooh, I should shoot something. So I got up, I got up Sunday morning and went to Harlem and photographed around, and then um, wound up around the time church was letting out, which maybe if it's a Baptist church, one or 1.30 or something like that. And this was Mount Olivet Baptist Church, which is a church I was familiar with because my mom was a member there coming from the south up to New York. And this is a church that she sent us to from Brooklyn to Harlem. Um, we were, um, you know, so, so that's the church I got baptized in. So at this point, I was no longer going to church, but I remembered that um, location and just found, and I just stood on the steps and made photographs. Um, 1975, this is an image made in Birmingham, Alabama, and it's a photograph of my grandmother at, at lunch. And this was, um, I was photographing my grandmother. And, you know, I always thought that my family was special. And um, some people looked and said, this is just your family. But it's, you know, but I realized that the images that we make for ourselves becomes 
the, the images become important for other people, for other reasons. And so the things that, that mean something to me also could mean something to you. And that sort of gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, and this was a photograph that was chosen um, to be exhibited at FestAC 77, which is uh, the Festival of Arts and Culture, uh, Black and African Arts and Culture held in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, so this image was made in 75. I submitted it as part of a portfolio of images, and this was supposed to have been um, exhibited at FestAC. And when you read the book, you'll find out what happened to that image. <laughs> this, is, this is 1977. One of the photographs made at FestAC, it doesn't, look, when you look at it, to me, it's black folks flying through the air. You, get a sense of freedom and just levity, you know, defying gravity and, um, and joy. And even though it's not the iconic Festac image, it's one that I wanted to include in this presentation just because of the way it made me feel. And so 1977, I went to Nigeria, and then 1980, 1978, I met this man, uh, Al Santana, my road dog. He's still Still, still riding today. Um, this is a, a, a black and white Polaroid made by a neighbor, and it's you know, it, every, the image that means a lot to you doesn't have to be clear, doesn't even have to be in focus. You know, it just has to give you that feeling. Um, and so, I, I when when I'm making a photograph, and this is not a photograph that I made, but when I'm making a photograph, I'm feeling something, and I'm hoping that you feel that same thing, or you feel something when you're viewing the photograph. In 1981, Al and I had a baby, and this baby is now almost 42. He's 41 and a half. And I thought that this was the last photograph that I would make, because I didn't know how I was going to be a photographer and a mother. It just didn't seem like, I, the, and now in my advanced age, I know there's no such thing as either or, it's both and, and that's what happened. I was a photographer and a mother. In 1981, 1985, um, Al and I finished a film. We had started working on it actually in 1980, Voices of the Gods, which is a film about um, the Akan and Yoruba uh, religious traditions that were still being practiced in the United States. And we, we just had this collaborative thing going, you know, with us. And I think that's one of the things, filmmaking sort of made us feel that we can do anything, we can have kids, we can do this together, we can do that, you know, because you, you can, you're not alone on, on the journey. That's 1985, 1986. Um, well, after Voices of the Gods was finished, uh, I was I I was part of a you know I didn't I didn't think about this when I was making the presentation, but I was part of a photojournalism workshop that was held in the summer at Empire State College, and I was going to do a photo story about the Senegalese tradespeople were selling wares on the streets, but of New York City, but, and I'd made contact with people to photograph, but the police started busting them before I did the shoot. And I was like, ah, oh, shoot, you know, what am I gonna do? And I went back and I had photographed all these religious and spiritual events, and I just pulled together all of the photographs I had done prior to this. I realized I'd been photographing these kind of things all along, I always had like a, spiritual bent, I pulled those photographs together and then continued to make others. And this is an image that was made at the first annual community baptism for the African family. And it was in 1986 and I wasn't really, this is a photo, I photographed that event because I was part of the event. And so a lot of the images that you see were images that when people ask, what do you make pictures of? And I was like, me, you know, <laughs> because these are things that, that, that I was doing. Um, 1990, we, Al and I had a daughter, and uh, our whole family is a family of, of artists now. My son is an artist. 
His wife is an artist. His, his son is an artist. Al is an artist. I'm an artist. Daughters, every, we all, like, we call ourselves the, the Santana Project. Um, it, well, I'm the only person who doesn't go by the last name Santana because, mm, you know, that, you know, anyway, I won't. That, <laughs> Okay, it's all right. I, lo I love them. I, <laughs> I love all the Santanas. <laughs> in 1993, I was in art. I, I needed a studio. I was collecting things. I, was, I had so many things that I'd collected um, in uh, pursuit of the uh, Eugene Smith uh, a grant in humanistic photography that I just, I needed space to put all these things and I was looking for a studio and the first studio that I got was, and I was an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem in, uh, from 1993 to 1994. And at the time on 125th Street, there was a Woolworths and I love a machine made photograph and they, there was a photo machine in there and I went in there and made, um, photograph of myself and then I made an ID card, my soul sister ID card. And you know, and it's funny, I had to um, block out the, this is 1993, I had to block out the address and the phone number because I still have the same address and the phone. And I, I don't want you coming to my house. <laughs> so 1994 was the culmination of my um, residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem and I pulled together elements and made an installation. And this was one of the installation photographs made. Um, in the far, far, far left of the screen is an Egungun um, garment, which is an ancestor garment. We had, had photographed an Egungun um, celebration at, uh, at Oyotunji Village in South Carolina. And um, when I had the studio at the Studio Museum in Harlem, in Folly, I thought, like, I had some of my grandmother's, I grew up with my grandmother's quilts, and I had some that were really raggedy, and I thought, well, I'm going to repair these quilts. I didn't know anything about repairing quilts. And I didn't repair the quilt, but in the end, I had an, uh, an uh, priestess of Oya in the Yoruba tradition who created an a ancestor garment out of my grandmother's quilts. And um, so I'm going to make a huge leap right now to... 2022, because we don't want to be here all night. But th these are some, so what you've seen so far are some of the things that sort of went into the making, went into like, how did I get to Nigeria? It's a long, it's, it's a long story because the Festac 77 was supposed to have been Festac 75 or maybe 74, but because of geopolitical events, it didn't happen until 1977, and it's so great that it happened at all. Uh, this is the cover of the book, and I worked um, with my editor, uh, Ola Remy C. Onabanjo, and very early on in thinking about the book, she said, you have any thoughts about the name? And I just said, Last Stand Legos. And we actually were gonna use another image and I was for the cover, and I was like, no, let's use this image, and this was the absolute last image I made in Lagos, Nigeria. And it, we wanted to do a book that, um, and this book only deals with 30 days in the life of an almost 70 year old woman. So I just want you to all know that there's a lot more that came, went before there and a lot of photographs that came after that. Uh, but this is just 30 days and um, that's, Look at a couple of the images from Last Stand Lagos. I, I, I don't know if I should say anything. Well, yeah, I will say something. These are, uh, this, these are people queuing up to get inside of the National Stadium uh, where the opening ceremony was held. Um, and this is also the day of the opening ceremony. This was, and I have notes because I'm always forgetting names. That's why I did the book because, you know, I can't remember everything, but it's sometimes when I forget something, I actually open the book and find out. So this is uh, Duro Ladipo, who was a uh, sort of like a state um, poet, uh, performer. And um, right now, my work is on exhibit, not only at 
the Museum of Modern Art in, in New York City, but also in an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum called Africa Fashions. And when I look at this image now, um, I'm looking at all of these fabrics that were made in Nigeria, uh, Ashoke, and it's like woven um, gold threads. And it's just, I fell in love with, um, with fibers. Maybe I, you know what? No, I didn't fall in love. I always loved fibers. I always, I grew up with my grandmother's quilts. I always had that sense of, mm, I don't know what to, you know, of wanting to touch something. And um, while in Nigeria, I saw the lightest of blues all the way to blue, black, uh, indigo. I saw woven materials. And to this day, like, I'm at, you think I'm a photographer. Deep down inside, I'm a fiber person. But <laughs> these are, you know, uh, Festac was just a, a festival of gazes. Everyone, you know, we'd read about Africa in books and saw pictures, and maybe they saw Americans in, um, you know, movies or something like that. But this is where everybody was looking at everybody. And um, there were also some wonderful reunions. One photographer, um, this is uh, Ted Pontiflet who's already living in Nigeria. He was selected to be part of Festac, but he was already in Nigeria. So, um, and he met up with, see, and I knew I was going to forget his name, so, uh, Abdul Rahman. And they were good friends in the States. And here they are reuniting uh, in the middle of the field uh, in Lagos, Nigeria. This is a photograph that became the iconic Festac photograph. Uh, I, when I came back from Nigeria, and not immediately afterwards, you know, I made small prints of some of the images that I really liked, and I had a limited budget, um, so I didn't really see all that I had, all the images that I had made. But this was one image that I thought, well, I'm going to make postcards of this, and I'm going to, you know, have, and I thought of it as a, to be the first of a series of postcards, but this was a series of one, and I made postcards of this image, and someone, in the internet age, uh, who had a postcard, they, I don't know what the edition was, but someone um, scanned it and put it on the internet, and it just, like, if you Google Festac, this image most likely will come up. It's been attributed to other phot photographers. It's been what, was, I think in people's minds, when you look at it, it looks old. And it's so old, whoever made this picture must be dead. So they, <laughs> people just use it freely, I, I believe, but those days have ended. Um, this was a photograph um, made of one of the people who worked at, uh, as part of the festival, they were called Protocol, and they would take us around and, you know, I think they were mainly like, student, like college students who were working uh, the festival. Um, Festac. Um, Ni Lagos, Nigeria, the government of Nigeria hosted this world festival and um, built buildings, a lot of infrastructure. We lived in a, a, a development that was called Festac Village. It, if you think of Olympic Village, um, housing was built to house like all of the thousands of people. And uh, this is uh, the National Theater, which was built um, for the event of Festac. Lots of unions and reunions. This is um, David, uh, left to right, David Steffens, uh, Ohinero Akpamuje, uh, Frank Smith, who I just recently heard passed away, and Valerie Maynard, who recently uh, passed away. So um, these were people, like, I knew Valerie because when I was a college student, I studied printmaking with Valerie Maynard at the studio. Museum in Harlem, and Frank Smith I met there at Festac and just adopted him as my brother. I stayed on in Nigeria, gave Frank, who I just met, the keys to my apartment in Brooklyn, and he came back and stayed in Brooklyn for a while. So lots of great um, you know, friendships were made. This is Queen Mother Moore, Audley Moore, um, who I knew, I, I didn't know, no, but I knew of um, from my activist student days, rallies, and you know, her talk about reparations and, and self-defense, and Queen Mother Moore came over. There were two groups of, of uh, US, US participants, 
and I was in the first contingent, and there was, and if you think about it, it was like a shuttle. The State Department uh, gave, um, gave us a plane, and one plane brought the first contingent over to Nigeria and then went back, and then brought the second contingent over and took the first contingent back, so it's just one plane. Um, and the only time that the two contingents were together um, was like maybe for a couple of hours there in, in Lagos at, on the tarmac. And here is an image of members of the first contingent um, greeting members of the second contingent. And it was just like a joy, you know, first contingent people were talking about what they'd seen, what they had done, what, and the second contingent people were excited. So it was, it was a grand moment on, on the tarmac. Um, in, in Fessac Village, there were you know, lots of performers and, and artists, and people had to rehearse. And I was on my way one day to do my laundry. Didn't even bring my camera with me. And there I found myself um, listening and just stuck in a sunrise orchestra rehearsal. And they rehearsed a long time. So I was there a long time, and I thought, you know, I should photograph this. So I walked all the way back, got my camera, came back, photographed, and they still rehearsed a long time. I don't think I even stayed for the end of the rehearsal, but I was there, you know, for at least three or four rolls worth of, uh, of images. Um, every, every event was an exceptional event, and I think I could say every event of our, even the most mundane events can be, something could be made of it that it says something or it can make someone feel something. And so not everything was all stardom, but this was uh, at the end of the festival where Stevie Wonder was um, uh, performing. And this is Stevie Wonder on the drums. The close of the festival, um, this is a Senegalese contingent um, on the closing day marching into the stadium and everybody, every country had a uniform, clothing, fabric made, and the Americans, we didn't know, you know, we didn't know, no one told us, we were just raggedy, you know. <laughs> the word used most often was ragtag, but you know, jeans or whatever, we still were appreciated. Uh, lots of, you know, time to rest and meet with other contingents. And um, this is a, a scene on Lagos Road a lot of fires on the road, just, I don't know whether they're burning trash, I don't know. And this was the last day in Lagos. Um, I had, um, you read the book, right? Uh, <laughs> I got stranded, I was stuck in Nigeria, and I finally got enough money together to get a ticket. And the day, I was so tired of Nigeria by that time, the day I got a ticket, I was in town a while, bought a couple of gifts, and then just came back, packed my bags, and was on the, the, the plane out of there that, that night. And so that car that you see was a car that I was in. It was a, a car now, um, that was not allowed into Festac Village, so I had to get out of that taxi and wait for a car that was allowed in to, um, to take me to where, um, to where I was living. And you know, if you know anything, or if you, even if you've seen photographs well, at least for the last half an hour, you know that I like people and faces and I like to engage people. I was so tired of Nigeria at that point. This was the end of the festival. This is past the end of the festival. And I just said, you know, here I am. And, and it, I wasn't trying to get faces. I was just making a statement about being where I was. And um, that's um, the next image after this was the wing of a plane. And uh, so now, you know, Festac 70, in last day in Lagos was really, we were very careful not to name the book Festac 77 because it was such a big thing. Nobody could really just talk about the, the I could only talk about my slice. And this book is my slice of, I mean, there were 50,000, 20,000, I don't know, thousands of people there. And one thing I'd like to do is to be able to hear other people's voices, other, maybe look at their ephemera. If I hadn't made these photographs, I don't know if I would have believed that I had even witnessed this. So it's really good to make a document of, uh, of, of your life. 
And that is the end of this fest. Thank you. <laughs>
You're definitely one of my influences. <laughs> and thank you for the oh, work you've done. Thank you. You know, I've always been. Those were my seeing eye children. A lot of Indeed. times I would have my kids with me. They said, do you see that over there? And I would get down. It's like, oh, yeah. Indeed. <laughs> well, you always have the ability to fit in with people. And I've always think of the big picture in photography. Mm. But you were able to, you are able to tell intimate stories because mm. you're like a chameleon. Mm -hmm. And people feel very comfortable in your presence. And your work shows that even with this and all the beautiful photojournalism that you've done Thank in you. New York City, your beautiful work in Songs of My People. Oh, and uh, that's just my personal reflection of oh. the wonderful Marilyn Nance. Oh, thank you. Well, what, <laughs> well what, what Jeffrey was talking about, wait a minute, this is another testament. What Jeffrey was talking about was my cloak of invisibility because I really don't stand out. And so that chameleon thing is just like, you know, when in Rome, you know, you just kind of blend in. Hi, Marilyn. I'm C.W. Griffin. Um, These are my songs of my people brothers right there. <laughs> I have a quick question. Um, do you remember what years you were at Olatunji? 1981. 81. Okay. So was King Adafumi the first there at that time? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I went to Olatunji after you. In 81. In, in, his, in his latter years. Uh-huh. And, and did that Igungung festival. And, you photographed that as well? Oh, yes. Wow. And, and spent a lot of his final years there. Um, wow. And after he passed, many of his wives moved here to Miami. To Miami? Yes. And a lot of his children are still here in Miami and in, down in Key West. Now, well, how did Miami get to be that center of everything? <laughs> no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's as, in Miami. As Jeffrey said, thank you so much for your work. And thank you so much for gifting us with the opportunity to view it. You know how I can date how long I've known you? Because when I was part of Songs of My People, I got a phone call um, and they said, well, we want you to be part of this book project. And I said, yeah, I'm interested, but I just gave birth. And it was like, what? I was like, yeah, I just had a baby. And so in some of the Songs of My People photographs, and I remember CW you used to like hold Rafia. I mean, so, so yeah, so that was 33 years ago. <laughs> wow. Don't date us. Don't date us. Wow. I can't believe it. 30. Wow. I was asked tonight, like, how long have you been photographing? And I was like, I don't want to say. But, <laughs> but it was said in the introduction. I won't remind you. <laughs> no more questions? Hi there. I don't know if I Good should. Good evening. I'm very curious as to sort of when it was that you had a moment of clarity in terms of your trajectory and your career. Like when it was that you understood that you were a photographer, that you knew that this was sort of where you were going in your life. Was that something that sort of clicked or was it something that sort of happened as a matter of sort of doing the work as being in the practice? Good question. I, when, when I was a student, when I was a young person, I mean, like a lot of people, I had a lot of different abilities. And, you know, I studied copywriting, art direction, filmmaking, video making, audio, radio production, photography. I was generally interested in communications. And nobody wanted, like, no, nah, that's not possible. And so I just kind of thought, like, OK, photography. That, you know, I just did it. Be, and now we're in a world where we can do many of the, lot, a lot of different things on one digital platform. But back then, it's like, you got to choose one. And just as a matter of being clear in the world, that was something, that was one of the many things that I was able to do. And I, start, I started in filmmaking, 16 millimeter filmmaking, but then you needed lights and crew. And, and in a photograph, you can make one thought happen, one visual thought happen by yourself. And I, you didn't need the other people. And, you know, and, you know I'm, I'm married to Al Santan, who's a uh, photographer, a filmmaker, I'm sorry, filmmaker primarily, but now he's a painter. And I asked him, like, why are you painting? Because he said, if you, 
if you want to do a film, you've got to raise money, you've got to get a crew, you've got a schedule, but when you paint, you have an idea and you do it. And that's it. So there's, there's power in just being able to like, just have a thought and be able to express the thought. Now the next step is getting that thought out there because I express these images. Um, you know, those, those images should be running. The, they are? Oh, okay, I don't see it. I'm sorry. <laughs> those, um, thank you. Um, those, those, the, the thoughts that you have sometimes reside with you, but you want to get them out in the world. These images that you're seeing have existed since 1977. So I'm not the only one, like I can make the images, but you need people to help get the word out there. The, the fact that this book has been made has brought me to Miami and I'm thankful and people are able to see the images and, and maybe go further and look into it. But um, sometimes it takes time too. So uh, n now I can say I'm an artist. I don't have to say I'm a photographer, but I'm known for my photographs. But you know, I've done writing. I mean, we all do a lot of things. But it, when was I clear? I've always been clear. No. <laughs> Now, I mean, as a child, I really f remember thinking stuff. Like, I couldn't wait to grow up. Just so I could just do what I wanted to do. So I, for folks who said they'd like to be a child again, no thank you. <laughs> Your compositions are amazing, and they fill the whole frame. I'm curious, you. do you... Uh, try to shoot full frame shots or are some of these images cropped in the darkroom? None of the images that you see were cropped. Now, I didn't realize this, but in my training, especially in the time that I was uh, working uh, in, the, in the public relations lab at uh, Pratt Institute, that we were like printing things with a black frame, like full frame and we would shave the negative carrier in a way to show in our printing, there'd be a black line around the image to show that everything that you see is what we saw. So I was technically against cropping and the things that, there are some images that didn't work, that may have had good elements that I just didn't show, but now in this digital age, I, I might mess with that a little bit, but um, what you're seeing is, is, is full frame. Um, it wasn't until I spoke with uh, the curator, Clément Chirot, who was telling me that that was um, something that, um, oh, uh, this was like Cartier-Bresson was talking, it, that was his thing. And I didn't know that I had been influenced by Cartier-Bresson, but I was there with other photo students and they were shooting full frame and that kind of, so, I, so the fact that these are full frame kind of puts me in a specific photographic realm that even I didn't know until recently that I, I was a part of. So you may look at me as a black photographer, but, you know, but there were people who said, well, you should really study, um, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget the names, like August Sander. Someone says, oh, your work reminds me of like Walker Evans and August Sander. And, and you know, so all, if you look up American photographer, you won't see my name. Matter of fact, you won't see any black, well, I Googled American photographers because I was trying to remember Walker Evans' name. And I've said, well, certainly if I Google American photographer, I'll, I'll find that. Um, half of the list, there were like 47 names that I saw. Half of them were women's names, like 20-something women's names. No women of color that I could recognize. Um, two black people's names, that was uh, um, Van, uh, James Van Der Zee and Gordon Parks. And so, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was like make myself part of, of, of uh, photographic history. And I thought about this when my son was little, he studied, he, he had to do a project on a black inventor. And we went into the book of like American inventors and we saw no black people. It wasn't until we went to the book of black inventors. Now we're part of American history. I'm part of photographic history. And um, it wasn't until this editor, this curator, this scholar, 
uh, Remy Onobanjo wrote the book that, that people could see. You know, you have to have your own book. Um, you have to, um, I'm in so many books. I have a whole bookcase that's full of books with my photographs in it, but you won't get to know the work until you see like a collection of my own work in, um, in one place together. But, um, but the, the older I get, the more I learn about the makings of, you know, my own photographs. Hi, good evening. I feel so blessed to have met you and, and viewed these wonderful photos. Thank They're you. so um, vibrant and intimate. And um, as I look at them and I think of you doing this in 77 and coming back to the United States, like, how did your life change after this immersive experience, which I feel like I've been a part of <laughs> just <laughs> viewing the photos. Thank you. But how did your life change um, in terms of you know, bringing these back to the United States, conveying what you've learned, and you being in Africa and absorbing that and bringing all these back. Yeah, I was so excited to, like, to share these images. And so I made prints and mailed them out to people and gave prints to people. Um, but there were limits to what I could share. And then, like, it's 1977, I started working in advertising. You know, I started a family and just lived the rest of my life. And these, these images weren't buried or anything. They were, you know, occasionally I would show one or two somewhere or maybe publish some. But and it wasn't a secret, but um, and it, and I did try to get them published, but there was no interest in, in the work. So my life didn't change. It, it, I mean, the... the ex, the experience of being at Festac just kind of like floated me for the rest of my life. I think that's one of the most life, I, I, I don't want to say changing because I don't know what I would have done without that, but just one of the most influential things in my life. It's, it was a big deal for everyone who was there and it just confounded me that, um, that it didn't carry through into the books you know, the art history books and even in black history. And there, there are some young people in Nigeria who grew up not even knowing that it happened. But I understand that the, it's still taught about in the East African um, universities. So it should be known. But so the question might be, why is this not known? Why? You know, and I, I guess I'll leave that up to the audience. I, I mean, I, I can't pose the question and have the answer, um, but I can show what I have. And I think that, you know, the, the essays in the book kind of leads you to different, you know, ways of thinking about that event. Uh, hi, Marilyn, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about your evolution of your photographic practice. Private practice? Your photographic practice mm -hmm. for the past, I don't know, 15 years or in your older age? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> this is my device right now. I have, um, I make a lot of photographs with, uh, with my iPhone. I'm not against, you know, it's just a weight thing. Um, I bought a new device and this was like too heavy for me. So I don't only bring it if I'm going to like do certain stuff. Um, my photographic practice now, I really make a lot of use of technology to share the works that I've done in the past and um, some of the some images that I make uh, like in the in the present day. I no longer photograph with film, though I have a refrigerator full of film, and one day I'm going to use it. You know, with film is like a hip thing now, you know, analog and outdated film, and I got it. Uh, my, so one, one day I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a project, um, but I photo, you know, I used to tell people I don't make photographs anymore. You didn't see the photographs I made, you know, 30 years ago. But in fact, I photograph every day, all 
I won't even tell you how many thousands of images are like in the cloud, on the phone, on the hard drive. You know, so digitally, like I have images, it's, it's, it's a mess. Um, but um, my analog work is like really organized because it's, it's finite, it's in one place. I know where this place is. I hope it doesn't burn down or flood, but because then that's that place. But yeah, so there's there's a there's a um, there's not an either orness about my photographic practice. It's both, and I I embrace um, you know all forms of documentation, whether photographic or recording or you know whatever. Everything is everything is everything. Question? Yeah. Take one more. I'm sorry, the, the lights are in my eyes, so that's why I'm doing this. Here you go. How, how, do you feel, how, do you, how do you feel making the transition to digital? I mean, I, I look at these pictures and I try to think about the lens you're using and uh, the technique, and, and some are you know, quite beautiful with the depth of field, and some you know, are a little shallower and have the bouquet. Mm -hmm. But you sort of lose, I mean, don't. I mean, my experience with digital is you sort of lose a little bit of that control, you know, with the digital, with, with these phones, because of the depth of field is so infinite. How, how this, do, you, do, you, do you find that as well? Or how, this how is sometimes a beauty in, in losing control. Control isn't everything. So, you know, a little chaos might be okay. I think that's the perfect note to end on. But before we <laughs> give a round of applause, a reminder, thank please you. go grab a copy of Last Day in Lagos up at the top. And now, thank you, Marilyn. Thanks. Thank you, Anita. <laughs>